Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, come on. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Everybody good? Yes. Good. Looking all right. Looking all right. <laughs> Looking all right. Some of you are smiling. What's up? Can we form our faces that we're happy? Can we tell our face you're happy? I'm happy? Come on. There's, there'll come a time when you won't have any teeth, so you all better do it now. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Amen. I'm laughing because, because I was in Tanzania preaching, and a pole from the tent hit me in my mouth. I knocked out nine of my front teeth. And they took me to the, 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 the union office, uh, where is a, a dental place, and, and they proceeded to pull these, the, the broken teeth out of my gum um, with only a little top of cane that you rub on your thing. And, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm a crybaby. Some, some of you probably know I'm a crybaby. I cry regularly. But uh, that wasn't fine. I was bawling, you know what I mean? I was in pain. And, uh, and, and, and they had nothing better to give me. And, uh, and I remember laying there on the dentist thing, and they were pulling out all these things. And then I had to carry on preaching for their camp meeting um, with, with, with stitched up mouth and, and, and no front teeth. And, and so I, I began to realize that I won't always have my teeth. Come on, say amen. So I, I smile every moment I can get, amen? And for those of us that we're dentists now, amen. amen. If we can't, yeah, we've got to gum it every now and then, amen. And God accepts that too, amen. Anyway, I just want to say that church is a happy place. And I didn't come here to be miserable, amen. And I want to thank um, Maria and Sophie for your words and testimony. I'll tell you why in a moment. They mean a lot to me, a lot to me. So let's have a word of prayer and then we get into the word. Father, we bless you this morning for your awesomeness and for the way in which you guide us. Lord, I... Our journey is all about you. And so thank you again for including us in your destiny. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, I don't like podiums. Amen. Ever since I left the Catholic Church, I don't like podiums. I just feel that I'm working not where I'm supposed to be. So can I just stand here? Is that cool? Is that cool? Every now and then I will sit down because I, I don't mean preaching at all about standing up either. But let's begin, let's begin. Uh, if you've got a Bible, I suppose a sermon is not a sermon pastor unless you have a text. So let's go to Luke. Um, I'm toying. Let's go to Luke chapter 13. Let's go there. Luke chapter 13, when you found it, say amen. And if you haven't found it, say wait. The wait's habit. And the liars are still turning the page. Luke chapter 13. When you haven't say amen. If you haven't say wait. Uh, and I will read, I will read verse 13 for you, and then we'll pray. You found it, say amen? amen. All right. Some of you will have to take back the Bible school and teach you the books of the Bible. I can see that. The Bible reads in Luke 13, 13. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. The Bible is the best book ever written. The Bible is so well written that you cannot help but find hope in its pages. The Bible is such a wonderful book that even when you're down, it helps you get back up. I'm going somewhere, so, so you'll, you'll, you'll look like you're ready for a sermon. Some of you look like you're ready to watch a movie. And, and, and the difference between, and let me tell you this now so you can get in the mode real quick. The difference between a sermon and a movie is that the person who is preaching is speaking God's word. And, and when you speak God's word, there ought to be a response. Uh, only if you've gone through what the preacher is preaching about. Uh, then you can say hallelujah, because it's the highest prayer. Amen is not a praise word. It means you agree. So if you haven't been through it, but you agree, you say amen. But if you've been through it, and God has taken you out the other side, then you ought to say hallelujah. Amen. Because we give God the highest praise when we come to church. They're confused. Pastor, they're confused. They're confused. They're confused. They're confused. Like, sorry, we'll get there because we've been so conditioned to say amen for everything. One size fits all. You know what I mean? 
but, 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 but when I come to church, I put on my best suit, amen, because I, I give God the best. And so I must give him the best praise, which is hallelujah. And the reason why that's important is because hallelujah is the only praise word that has God in it. Hallelujah. God. Yahweh. Right? So that's who you praise it. So to say amen, we could do that to anybody. Alright, we're gonna get there. 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 And so oh, here I was. I was I was I was called to the house and, and, and I, I didn't know who called me. The person said, just go to the house, and when you go to the house, you're gonna see a situation that you need to deal with. So being as obedient as I am, yeah, right. I made my way, I made my way. <laughs> I made my way to that house, and it was San Jose, California, where I was pastoring the Ephesus Church. And as I made my way to the house, I'm making my way to the house, I'm, I'm praying because I believe prayer changes things. Amen. If God has ever done something through prayer for you, you should have said, hallelujah. If he hasn't, then you should have said, And so I'm making my way to the house. And as I'm making my way to the house, I'm, I'm moving with prayer because there's something about prayer that changes the situation before you get there. There's something about prayer that prepares the man of God for whatever he's about to encounter in Jesus' name. And so I'm making my way towards the house. And as I make my way towards the house, I'm saying, God, in the name of Jesus, bind every demonic force in the name of Jesus Christ and send me there equipped to deal with the situation. I get to the house and, and I can hear this person screaming. And the one they're screaming is, is nobody cares. Nobody cares. And I peek to the window and I look around this woman and there's bottles of pills all around her. Nobody cares and nobody cares. I realize now I've got to take the matters into my own hands. And so I didn't knock the door, I knocked the door down. And I run inside of the room and I, and I make sure I move the pills away. You know what I'm saying? And, I, and then I, I, I grab hold of her and I say, somebody cares. She looks up at me and says, Pastor, what are you doing here? I said, because somebody cared enough to call to say that you were in a mess. That was the beginning of awesome things. While I was in San Jose, California, passing Ephesus Church, I met a pastor from the Methodist Church who was opening a recovery home, drug recovery homes, all around the city. He said, Pastor, I need you and your church to back me. So we backed him. Gave him money. Gave him the church on Sunday to have a, a meeting, a, a, a service for all recovery addicts. You already hear what I just said. Uh, we didn't do it on Saturday because they weren't used to going to church on Saturday. It's a journey. And so you got to take people, come on now, up where they are familiar before you can take them to unfamiliar. Uh, if you can train them in the familiar, when you take them to the unfamiliar, they will be so high in praise that they will just be willing to be obedient. Come on, say amen. The Almighty quiet in here. And so, and so, and so we, we call the church All Nations. And it was all recovering addicts. And let me tell you about addiction. It wasn't until I fell in ministry that I realized that everybody has an addictive tendency to some of you. Almighty fire in here. When you're willing to give up your family, come on now, and your food and your everything, just for a moment of pleasure, you're an addict. And it could be shopping, it could be sex, it could be money. Talk to me, somebody. It could be all of those things. And God had to take me right there. So now I became sympathetic. Come on now. So from the preacher to the pew on a Sunday at 1.30, everybody was an addict. Yes. And boy, we started church. Now my Saturday church, which was about 150 people, uh, was nice. They sang well. The quality was awesome. Talk to me, somebody. The quality was awesome. Uh, the violin and the flutes and everything, the piano was played well and everybody was suited and booted. But on Sunday at 1.30, 
the gospel at its choir, led by Sister Hadnett from Los Angeles. They sang different, let me say that. But they sang from the heart. <laughs> and then everything they did was not predicted. It wasn't scripted. There was no bulletin. It was the power of the Holy Ghost. Sometimes we're there from 1.30 till 5.30, 6 o'clock. We're still praising God. And there were 300 people in the house. We couldn't do it on Sabbath because the book on Sabbath was so perfect. And so well groomed, they disciplined. Come on now. That, 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 it was too, they, were, they were just too good for this service. But, 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 but I, I preached on Sabbath, but when I preached on Sunday at 1.30, Lord have mercy, it was, it was from my heart, it was from my experience, it wasn't from my theology class or my Greek text. Come on now, it was God saw me sinking deep in sin, grabbed me, but well, just before I hung myself. Remember one day, I'm preaching in, at 1.30. This lady gets so happy because she's been 30 days clean. And she got so excited. And she was jumping up by the window and broke the window with her butt. <laughs> the deacon, who is an Adventist, come on, say amen, is now looking in horror and said, Pastor, that's how we shouldn't have church on Sunday. The Lord is trying to tell us that this is wrong. I said, my brother, if we could break all the windows because of our praise, then the world would hear us. Come on, say amen. Praising the heart. Anyway, forget all that. <laughs> then what happened next was just amazing. After we opened the homes, I decided to run 12-step program every Monday night. It was so amazing that the first Monday we had about six addicts come and they were cool and we did the thing, went through the 12 steps and powerless over this and went through that. Then the Lord told me something. The Lord said, give them all the book Steps to Christ. I, I didn't want to give no one out like books. I just felt that, you know what I mean, they were just going to get totally in bondage and they were going to come back to the church. Because that's how it was taught to me. My mom wanted to beat me up about something, she goes to Ellen White. When she wanted to get great, she goes to the Bible. Ellen White became the thing that got beat up. For those that don't know Ellen White, that's all the subject. And so now, Steps to Christ. Pastor, I didn't know that every chapter in the book Steps to Christ mirrors the 12 step program that they teach recovering addicts. Had no idea. And so I'm sitting there and reading, I gotta read it ahead of time. I'm reading the book and I'm saying, hold on a second. Every one of those chapters mirrors one of the 12 steps. Then I go online and there is a workbook for the, for the steps of Christ. So what do I do? I change the whole meeting to steps of Christ, recovering addict, 12 step program. It is still going today. That ties about 37, 38 people out of that program. You all need to say amen. amen. You know that don't happen in London, but for an evangelistic crusade, come on, say amen. And, and so, and so we, we baptized the folk. But what was powerful was we couldn't put the folk back into mainstream church. And let me tell you why. Because I'm preaching, and there's a lady who's running around the church, constantly running around the church. She's running around the church. And I'm looking at this lady, she's running around the church. The members have a board meeting afterwards to say, why this woman every Sabbath running around the church? So now here I am, and I'm trying to tell them that the lady's probably had a, a victory. And so she's praising God in her own way. But we don't do it like that, Pastor. It's irreverent. And so, if you're a pastor, you must abide by the board. Come on, say amen. Otherwise, you're going to be fighting until Jesus comes. And, 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 and if Jesus has been gone 2,000 years, come on, say amen. It could be a long fight. And so here I am. Can I talk to you? I'm just talking. What are you listening? Don't hold it against me, please. Don't write the bread and tell them I didn't really preach today. But we're going to get a little bit of shout on in a minute. But here I am now, and, and, and the woman's running around the church. So I call her in after the service, and I say, Sis, why are you running? The members are just in sense about you running. She said, I used to go to the homeless mission, the rescue mission, and preach. 
She said, when you came there one day, you told us that when God has blessed you, you ought to let the whole world know. And you must give it unceasing praise. And she said, so when I came to your church, she said, I used to shoot heroin in my groin. And it, and it was an abscess there. And the abscess was so bad I couldn't walk. When I came to hear you preach, I couldn't walk. But from that sermon, I was clean and sober. And she said, if I can make it to the church, I'm going to let the people know what God has done for me. So and she told, when she told me the story, I said, run, woman. Run. Run. Don't stop running. And then what makes a statement? That praise when given from the heart will not deter the preacher. And so the woman started running, and she ran, and she ran. So I'm here am I now, I'm telling the church board this, and they're looking at me like, I'm absolutely crazy. I said, I dare you to stop that woman from praising God. I said, the problem is, some of you need to start running. <laughs> so we opened the recovery home. It's called the Samaria House. After the woman of Samaria. For women and children. We got a donation of a 15 bed house. I said a donation of a 15 bed house. Open the recovery home. And, and, and the woman in there, they were coming, taking them out of, straight out of the, 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 off the street into the homes. And, and it was a Christian run program. Come on, say amen. The tension was almost 80%. Unbelievable what God was doing. Then all of a sudden I got a call across the way from another lady. And the conference had gave me a position. They created this position. Community Development Director. And I was happy because I didn't want to run no church. I, I commend any pastor that can pastor a church. I can't do it. I really can't. I, I don't have, I, I, sometimes I get real ignorant. You know what I mean? I just can't handle negative people. <laughs> Who complain about the color of the carpet, about the windows, and about and that's because they don't see themselves as being addicts. An addict is grateful just for the next day. But we ain't grateful. We gotta tell them that the seats are too concrete and this is happening, and this is happening, and this going on, and all kind of we just going all around the world. Hello somebody. Samaria house. We did some got a call. Lady says she has a four bed house that she wants to donate to the church. Go see Sister Owens. Sister Owens took me to the house. The man had died and said the house should be left for recovery addicts. And so she gives me the deed to the house and we set up the house called the Griffin House for men. And 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 so now we're running the home. In between that, we're running our Monday meetings uh, for recovery addicts. And I'm in the meeting. My name is Ray, and I'm a recovery addict. Took a lot to say that. Took a lot to say that. But I had to be true to myself. My healing didn't come in a church. It came in the meeting. And I wasn't bothered about who was smoking and drinking around me. All I knew was I was there. I was running it, but I needed it. Amen. Let me further. I was speaking at Glendale Adventist Hospital. In America, the Adventist owned the best hospitals. Amen. Like you all got a hold of here, right? <laughs> that was the case, we wouldn't have to find out about the lemon. We would have known about the lemon. <laughs> And I want to tell you, I go to the store three times a week and I rub my skin with lemon yes. while the pores are open. Yes. Hence the reason. <laughs> yeah. Let me know before I was born. So, yeah. so <laughs> what God did next in my life. I was speaking at Glendale Academy and I got two speakers. This one Judy comes running up to me, this Caucasian lady comes running up to me. Ray, Ray, Ray. And I say, whoa, whoa, whoa. And she's saying, she's saying, you need to meet my uncle. I'm saying, why do I need to meet uncle? Because he has a proposal for me. I go to meet an uncle, and the uncle's name is Steve Popko. Steve is, is, is an American citizen, but Steve is a doctor. 
uh, he deals with the skin, dermatology. What I speak to see, Steve now tells me that he always wanted to do a project called Healing on the Sabbath. And I said, what is it, Steve? He said, Ray, uh, I, I got this laser that removes tattoos from people that want to change their life, from addiction and from damage. And he says, we can offer it for free. As long as they sit through a Bible study before, before their treatment. And it takes five to six treatments in order to get the tattoo off. And I'm looking at God. Come on, I, I, I get so happy now that I, I hear what Steve's saying. And I'm saying, Steve, how are you doing? He said, we need to apply for a grant and, and get a, bit, a better laser called a lag laser. And this laser is so powerful, Ray, that it was, their skin would be like nothing was on, no tattoo was on their skin. So we apply for the grant. Never written a grant in my life, but guess what? I get $80,000. So we buy the laser. And now here we are, and we're in Burbank, California, about to offer free tattoo removals for those who are in addiction or those who are in gangs and want to change their life around. The first night was so packed. The service, and that they, they, they had to listen to me preach. Come on, say it. They had to and it was Friday night. And so the Sabbath started. I had to preach. Man, I preached the hell out of folk. Come on, say it. Every man preached. We made appeals, and, and people were coming, and we were anointing and laying hands. The next day, on, after divine worship, then they would come to the church. Come on now. And they would receive, they would receive the, the first treatment. And but before that, they had that prayer and counseling. Come on now, with the Bible workers. And then we gave them literature. And man, the thing began to take legs like they've never seen it before. ABC Corps, they gave us, they gave us the biggest award in Southern California for, for community service. NBC Corps, CBS Corps, they gave us plaques and trophies. We got grants, we got money. And today, man, today the program is still running uh, at the Burbank Seventh-day Adventist Church. Come on, say amen. And at the Bakersfield, because we expanded it to Bakersfield, where I moved, where I was pastoring, and to Bakersfield, California, the program is still running. Can we say amen? Healing on the Sabbath, removing scars of the past. Come on, say amen. Not only do we baptize, but we remove scars of the past. But then the fool can go down in water. But it's time for us to stop and say we've got to help people after the water. And so let me end by going to my text. There's a woman, and it's a Sabbath day. In Luke chapter 13 and verse 10. Most of Jesus' healing happened on the Sabbath. Hence the reason I'm here today. Come on, say amen. Because I need some healing. I didn't come here as a perfect person. I sin regularly. Help me, somebody. I sin regularly, but I know where to go now. <laughs> I know where to go. I don't have to live with no secrets. Because when you got secrets, the devil can manipulate your life. Yes, yeah. I learned in the in the, in the meeting, in the NA meeting, I learned, I learned that if I'm if I can admit my wrong, then I can get help. The church teaches you not to admit your wrong, but keep it down long enough so you won't be disfellowship, so you won't be censored, so you won't be so thrown out. Come on now. But I'm telling you now, victory is in admitting that you got a problem. And only God can help you. And they may disfellowship you and they may throw you out. But in the books of heaven, your name is still there. Yeah. God don't throw you out because of something wrong. We know David was still king after he sinned. We know Abraham was still the father of faith after he sinned. Talk to me, somebody. And go all the way through the Bible. And after that, God didn't take them out of position. Because God knows what you will do before you do it. But he still chooses you. What qualified me for ministry was not the BA and the MA, but the fact that I felt and God planned better. Now watch this last week. The woman is a Sabbath day. It's an awesome time. Sabbath day. And all men are in the front and women are in the back because that's how the society works. I would like to say things have changed, but I don't think they've changed too much. 
And so now Jesus is preaching and he's, and, and he's preaching the wonderful words of life. You know the words. Words so freely given, moving men to heaven. Wonderful words, beautiful words, wonderful words of life. There's nobody who can preach like Jesus can preach. Come on, say amen. And so Jesus is preaching and, and the woman is now bent over. And she's been bent over for 18 years. She's been looking at dirt, feeling like dirt, acting like dirt. No man would touch her. No one would look at her. They all said she had an infirmity. She was in a bad situation. Demons had rid 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 of her body. But she's looking down. But there was something about this Sabbath day. When Jesus was in the house. I tell you, boy, if you knew what I was about to say, you would free your mind of all negative activity and all worldly behavior and get ready for God to give you a breakthrough. Because there's something I'm about to say that's going to set you free today. Now watch this move. The woman is sitting at the back. Jesus has a nose that smells sinners. And so all of a sudden he stops the service and he looks up and he sees the woman. And he calls her forth. This woman who is demonically uh, riddled. Uh, this woman who has an infirmity. This woman who no one would look at. This woman who, who, who no one would touch or has no love and no affection. She's looking at dirt. She feels that dirt. If she could exchange her body, she would. Some addict knows that I'm talking about. When you sit at the back because you don't want to go to the front. When, when you, you wish you could change your habit, but it, it's an addiction and you can't. You look like dirt and you feel like dirt and you wish things were different but, and your children are gone and your, your man is gone and your home is gone and, and all you know is the next hit or the next fix. Talk to me somebody. Amen. But if only it was, if, if only it was substance abuse, it was different. But some of us have the other abuses. And we ought to realize that we are just like this woman. Some of us for over 18 years have habits that we need to kick. And we sit in church every day dressed up. Come on now. Covering our stuff with our lovely clothes. Acting as if we are better than other people. But let me tell you this. When you start admitting that you need God. And that God needs to change your life. You will become the highest in the kingdom of God. So the woman now is sitting there. The Bible says Jesus calls her for. Woman. Which is making your way for. How embarrassing. Have you ever walked down the aisle of a church when you feel the Holy Ghost is moving? It is the longest walk you could ever, I wish someone was here today. The longest walk you could ever walk is that walk. I remember, I remember, man, I was in church and, and Mark Finley was preaching and, and Mark was preaching and Mark was saying there's somebody else in here. And I'm sitting back in the church in Chiswick and we're talking, we're joking, we're acting the fool, doing all kinds of stuff. I know he ain't talking to me. But just at that moment, it's like I was in the zone. The Holy Ghost came. Come on now. And, and it got me in a position where nothing else mattered except what the preacher was saying. And I made my way down that aisle. It was a long aisle. My mother to my right was jumping pews. Come on, say amen. She was having a hallelujah good time. The son that was lost is now on the way back home. My sisters were over there praising God and thanking God that I was coming down the aisle, but I couldn't hear nobody, couldn't see nobody. All I could see was the Holy Ghost begging me to come and the preacher, I fell at the feet of the preacher in tears. The woman is coming to Jesus and she's moving slowly because when you are loaded with sin, you can't move fast. It's like an 18 wheeler, come on now, like a big old truck packed up to the rafters you're moving it's only after you meet Jesus and he sets you free that you can become right again come on say amen because he takes all your burdens oh, you only heard me he takes all your burdens away and so the woman now is in front of everybody everybody can see her sin she's wearing the sin the woman walks into my office as working the turning point the biggest recovery organization in California. And there's something about addiction, and ladies, you know, it fools you to think that you're the sexiest person out there. You have lost all your weight. Come on now. You, you know, your body or your curves are gone. Come on now. But, but because you are not fat, you just think that you're the sexiest thing. And so you've got hot, hot, hot pants on that is, you know, so big and anyway, so you just you walk into my office and hang on her waist and looking at me like, you know what I mean, what are you going to do for me this time? 
Before I even go to her, I begin to pray that Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, touch her, Lord, and change her mindset. When I open my eyes, she still got her hand on her word. Two days later, she comes back into my office. Okay, then, preacher, let me hear what you got to say. He sit down with a little attitude, you know what I mean? I said, I guarantee in 30 days, you're going to be clear to us. Yeah, right. So we go through group session, we go through therapy, we go through all kinds of stuff, and here she is, and she's sitting there, and she just attitude after attitude. One day, one day, she comes to my office in the morning, boiling. I said, what's wrong? She had lost her son, who she hadn't seen for over a year because of her addiction. And let me tell you what happened. She said, I want to die. I don't want to live no more because I was just living for my son. She got clean and sober. Amen. Let me tell you what happened. The rest of it may be not nice, but I think there's something in there for us. She's driving along the highway with her fiance. Underneath a truck is a piece of um, metal and it's making fire come out of the road. So they put alongside the man to tell him to slow down because and do something because there's fire coming up on the metal underneath. The man pulls over into the shoulder and they pull him behind him. And as they walk into the man's door to knock on the door, come to open the door, um, here comes another truck. And it hits Tracy so hard. Throws her across the freeway. Throws her back into the oncoming traffic. Tracy dies at dead on the freeway. I remember doing a funeral. She was a biker. And there was bikers from all over Los Angeles and I was doing the field. And I remember saying that after her son died, she said to God, I want to die. And I believe God held her long enough until she was clean and soaked. Until she stopped doing what she was doing. Until she gave her heart to Jesus. Ah, oh, you ought to hear me. And it was a joy to do the field because she was now ready for the kingdom of God daughter comes forward and the daughter comes forward and she's bent over. Jesus now puts his hand on her. Come on, say amen. A woman that has never received touch. A woman that no one likes and no one, no one's looked at. Here comes the Savior, the main man in town, puts his hand on her. And he says, woman, thou art loose from your infirmity. Immediately she straightens up. Come on, say amen. amen. When Jesus talks to you and works a miracle in your life, not only does he, oh Lord, not only does he heal you from sin, but physically you look different. Yeah. If you look the same, if you look the same after God is coming into your life, you got a problem. Yeah. If you're dressing the same, you got a problem. Come on now. I don't wear stuff that I used to wear. Come on, because God is coming into my life. I want to look like him and talk like him. I want to be different, peculiar, unusual. Come on now. I want people to see that there's been a change in my life. The first thing they say in the recovery meetings. My name is Ray and I'm an addict. And then they say how many days they clean them so So they can receive their chip. Come on, say amen. And when they get that chip, it's like a gold medal in the Olympics. 30 days clean. 90 days clean. Come on now, let me go down to this clean. And that's what the woman now can say. I met Jesus. And I'm clean. I'm clean. Clean than lemon could ever make you clean. The Bible says the woman now leaves that place and she goes out. If she had stopped there without doing what verse 13 says, she would not receive the eternal blessing that she received. The Bible says, and she glorified God. Church, God doesn't work a miracle for you to keep quiet. <laughs> We make noise about football. Talk to me, somebody. Yeah. We make noise about athletics. We make noise about if our children does well at school. We make noise about when we come to church, we sit down quiet like lumps like, like on a log. Come on, now. We just sit there all miserable. And we come to God and we're still miserable. And we leave and we're still miserable. We go to work and we're still... One man told me the other day, he said, I can't joke no more. He said, because Jesus is soon to come. I said, you on cocaine, man. Because God didn't tell you that. When I came to Jesus, can I preach for a minute? Yeah. When I came to Jesus, there was a joy. Joy down in my heart. And it was down in my heart to stay. The devil didn't like it, but it was down in my heart. And now I'm happy. So very happy that I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. And I don't 
say if nobody else glorifies him, I glorify him. I take a glorification break. Come on, say amen. You know, you're watching these senders and then they got a break. And then they, 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 and then this is sponsored by Totoro. <laughs> uh, and, and all kind of whatever it is they're doing. You know what I mean? Well, I, I just came back here to tell you this morning, this is sponsored by the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Yeah. Sponsored by the Holy Ghost. And can we just take a praise break real quick? Can you say amen? Can you say hallelujah? Can you say come on, hallelujah? Can you say praise the Lord? They seem to have no effect. But today, I just want to make an appeal. Can I make an appeal? Because I just believe that, 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 that we want to go beyond just hearing now. We want to do what God has asked us to do. I, I want to change it. And I believe, I believe it's important that we get to a point where we need to make change. Since the children was one of my Bible workers, when knocking on the door, as she knocked on the door, it was so deep to me that the woman came to the door was high on cocaine crack. She took the flyer, the signs of the time, and she went inside. For three years, the cheetah went back knocking on the door, and the girl would not come to the door. I'm working at Turning Point, while I'm pastor, and I'm working at Turning Point, they bring this woman into me. She's a prostitute. Has made more money than I'd ever made. And she comes to me very repentant, saying, I need help. After some counseling sessions, I invite her to church. When she comes into church, her name is Vicky, she comes into church and she couldn't believe. Wait, that's the old lady that knocked on my door over three years ago. And I used to see her through the curtain come every week knocking on my door. But I couldn't open the door because I was high. At the end of my service, I asked Vicky to stand up and give her testimony. In fact, the lady is today, she gave her testimony. And she said, Chido could not believe her eyes. She came running down the aisle, hugged her, and kissed her. And both of them embracing, I made an appeal. And the appeal was, there may be other people here in this situation where you will turn your back on God and wander away. You're too high to come to Jesus. Not only high with drugs, but high in love in your behavior. High in your habits. Talk to me, somebody. Right. High in your attitude. Too proud. And all of a sudden, people started coming. I remember we were baptized with them. And all the other 30 something we covered in habits. And I never forget, Vicky told me this. And she said, Ray, I'm going to make something of my life. I got a Facebook thing, actually, no, LinkedIn, whatever it is, thing from Vicky the other day. Graduated with bachelors, working on math. <laughs> got the children back. You already heard what I said. Got the children back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's going to be a social worker. Talk to me, man. And, and, and she's doing well. And she just wanted to hook me up to let me know that she's still in church. Come on, say it. And so today, someone needs a victory, someone needs a break. So wherever you are, wherever you are, I don't take wrong with the people. So if you want that, we got it here for free. And I ask you to do what the woman did. Get out of your seat. Make your way down here. Let's talk to God on your behalf. And the same God that healed that woman can take care of your infirmity this morning. So come on, come quick, come quick, come quick. If you don't want to come, stay where you are. Ain't got problem. My ego is not bruised, trust me. But if you really want to come to God to make a difference in your life, Come on. And we're talking about for eternity now. Come on. Okay. There's some things that need to go. They need to go.
I'm going to pray aloud, but I need you to pray in your heart. Because I don't know what it is you need God to do for you. But you do. Tell him. I guarantee you, he can fix you up. And make the changes that need to be made. We're down our heads and closing our eyes and let the corner of appear. There's a wrestling that's going on right now between heaven and hell for your soul. And so first of all, in the name of Jesus, I bind every demonic force from this place. In the name of Jesus, Lord, cast out the devil, cast out his hips, cast out his lies, Lord. Tell us we're not good enough and tell us we can't get healed. And tell us we done stuck so deep in sin that there's no hope for us. Lord, cast him out, bind him in the name of Jesus. We don't need him in our lives, Lord. Do something extraordinary in our lives. Work the miracles we've come looking for. Right now, Lord, this morning, we've come with our habits, we've come with our addictions, we've come with all the stuff that, Lord, that will keep us down. And we bring them to the feet of the cross and we say, in the name of Jesus, Lord, take them away from us. Make us different. Change our appetite so we love spiritual things. Open our eyes so we can see Jesus. Lord, somehow, in some way, affect us so that others will see the Christ in us. Whatever they have. Whether it be drugs. Lord, whether it be cocaine. Whether it be heroin. Whether it be weed. Whatever it is. Whether it be sexual sin. Whether it be lying. Whether it be stealing. Lord, in the name of Jesus. Take them out of us right now. Cleanse us of our infirmities. And then, Lord, fit us for the kingdom of God. Before I end my prayer, there's got to be somebody here that wants to see Jesus again. And the Bible says you won't see him unless you're born again. So you can't go to heaven without going through the water. And so right now, in the name of Jesus, you're lifting your hand in this place and say, could you pray for me? I want to be in the water and I want to see Jesus again in the kingdom. If that is you, lift your hand high so we can finish this prayer by praying for you. You're holding your hand. You're holding your hand. You want to be born again. God bless you. God bless you. Holding the hand high. Father, we are praying for those hands. Say, yes, by the water, I want to get to the kingdom. And so, Lord, in the name of Jesus, seal every decision. Lord, seal them for the kingdom of God. May the devil not have his way in their life. Lord, bind them and cast them out of their situation. Put a head of protection around them. And Lord, I pray that they will realize that somebody cares for them. And that's Jesus the Christ. Thank you again, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you for this moment of victory. Thank you, Lord, that we can hear a word and the testimonies we heard. Lord, thank you that you care about us enough to show us the way to go. We pray this prayer. With the forgiveness of our sins. In the worthy and precious name of Jesus. May everybody say. Amen. amen. Come on say amen like you mean. Amen. 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 Let me just say before you go back to your seat. Before you go back to your seat. There is a plan made for you. By the devil right now. To mess up this moment. Alright. Know that God is bigger. God has a better plan. You already heard what I'm saying. God has a better plan. And you can trust him. Don't look at the devil. Don't listen to what he tells you. Trust in God with all your heart. And lean up on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. Yeah. Is that cool? Yeah. So before you, if you go home and you're going to turn on the TV. Don't turn it on. Seek God first. If you go in the car before you turn on your radio. Don't give it gospel or not. Don't worry about that. Seek God first. Before you do anything from this moment on. Make sure your eyes are on Christ. Amen. God bless you. And we'll see you next time. Sorry I took so long. <laughs> Just before I set my seat, I got to, I know I'm probably out of place, but I got a, a little quick testimony. Can we give that real quick? You ready for a, a shout? Yes. You ready for a shout? Yes. You sure? Yes. All right, they, they, Pastor, play what a mighty God we, we serve, and then and then and then we we gonna shout after we hit. Is that alright? Yes. Now listen, when you're ready for a shout, that means you've got nothing crossed. Your legs ain't crossed. Your hand ain't crossed. Your bag is on the floor. Come on, man. Your bag is falling and put away. Is that alright? Like you're going on the flat. You know what I mean? Good, good. And open your mouth and smile like you. After she gets to be on shout. Come on. You, you, you're going to say 
Okay, um, my name is Alfie, as some of you know me, and um, I would like to share with you that stuff that God has done for me um, three weeks ago. Um, I was a smoker, smoking cigarettes, and the Lord has blessed me, and uh, now I'm free from cigarettes. Amen. Is that, that kind of regal shot y'all did? Yeah. If that shot was a woman, you would look at the full thing. Thank you. 